So I've been talking a lot on the show about the investment dollars going into AI. So why don't we talk to one of the investors? And in fact, she's recently written a book, and she even used AI to change the title versus the one I had a chance to read before they came out. Alicia Silberg joins me on this bonus episode of The Business of Tech. Don't you sometimes wish you could see what's happening in your customers' IT rooms you manage without needing to be there? Sentry from RF Code is the answer. Live and recorded video with motion detection offers better visibility than being there. Thermal imaging with 768 monitoring points combined with ambient temperature and humidity. And it's so easy to set up. Plug it in, scan the QR code, and you're done. Sentry helps you know about IT issues before your clients do. And listeners get 30% off your order of hardware and service with code MSP Radio on checkout. Visit rfcode.com slash MSP Radio and never be asked why you didn't know again. Alicia, thanks for joining me today. I'm very excited to be joining you. Thank you for having me. So the impetus to have you on is your book. And I want to understand a little bit about that before we dive into some of your venture work. Tell me a little bit about the book, your latest book, Unemployable, how I hired myself and what was the inspiration to write it? Well, for starters, it's, you talk about AI and my journey with AI. The book's title is actually Unemployable, How AI Transformed My Work and My Life. And it changed because I got received so much feedback from my audience and they were very fascinated by how AI had played such a huge role in my life. And so I was like talking about customers. It was important to engage with my customers in the way they wanted. So um, very excited to be talking to you about it today. So give me a little bit of that story. You've been working with AI for a lot longer than I've heard from many other people. Tell me a little bit about that story and, and your investment in time in AI. So my first experience in AI was in 2003. I was sitting in my actuarial board exams and they had in South Africa 40 of what were perceived as the smartest people in South Africa who could do math. And we had to learn 3000 formulae off by heart. And we had this little calculator and I sat there and I was like, after really like almost breaking my brain to learn these things, I was like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. You know, this is a third world country for all intents and purposes. You're taking 40 of the smartest people and forcing us to learn these things off by heart using this very backward calculator. I thought at that moment I wanted to be in tech full time. I'd always been obsessed with tech. I'd always seen it as this thing that helped me achieve my goals. And I knew at that moment, like this epiphany, that there was a machine that could be created that could partner with me and I could be the creativity and it could do the hard, heavy lifting. But there was no way that it was sustainable that every person could learn these formula. And it was just like this moment that I fell in love with the idea. And it was a beginning of a relationship that's almost two decades old now. And I've just built and built and built on it. And it's, it's just been an absolute gift and joy in my life. Now, it's interesting the way you phrase that, because I'm going to actually throw out something that I've been talking about on the show, and I would love to get your reaction to it, because the way you talked about AI there was very much like a partnership with the technology and the way you think about it. And Microsoft has been using their branding Copilot for their latest brand. And my premise has been that the successful uses of AI are when we partner human creativity with the machine in a collaborative relationship versus a replacement one. What's, what's your thought on that premise and the way you've been approaching it? Absolutely. This is something I'm extraordinarily passionate about and I've seen it firsthand. You know, you're hyper technical. The people that are around me are hyper technical. I'm not. And so the idea that I always had this disadvantage um, and I could find this partner which could enable me to work alongside you to create, you know, an extraordinary company, whatever the case may be, that was incredibly empowering. And that was my firsthand experience. And the more I started sharing that with other people, um, I have a friend, she's a psychiatrist, she wrote a book and she was curious, she's not technical, but she was like open-minded and curious enough to say, how could I partner with the AI to ensure that my readers get the very best experience possible when it comes to, um, uh, you know, the business that I'm in. A friend of mine is a writer, very, very talented Hollywood writer. At the same time, he doesn't come from America. So he's got challenges, you know, like English is not his first language. 
off the charts creativity stuck because English isn't his first language. Partnering with the AI enables him to be able to sell his scripts to Hollywood directors. He wasn't able to do it prior to the AI. Um, every one of the people I interact with, it's like taking that human creativity that can't be replaced by the AI, partnering with the AI, which can give you, in my case, the infrastructure when it comes to the technical capabilities and enabling you to literally become unstoppable. And I think there's so much fear around it, but coming from a place of curiosity and saying, how can this be my thought partner? How can this be my creative partner? How can this be whatever partner you need in order to achieve that goal you're trying to achieve? After two decades, I, I, I I can't implore people enough to just take that leap of faith because it's such a joyful journey. So you've spent a lot of time becoming a specifically an AI investor. Tell me a little bit about that journey and what you're looking for in those investments that you're making. So because it started so early, so um, I came to the US, I built a, uh, um, what was very early AI company and it was really tough to build because, you know, like nothing was available. It was if I tell you the links we had to go to to like hack this thing together, it was like <laughs> nothing short of a miracle that we managed to do it. But I learned so much in the process. For starters, I saw voice as being something critical in terms of our future and humanity. And so that was something I leaned into and I was very early. And so each one of the AI investments that I've made that have gone on to become very successful already, um, they were much earlier. So, you know, everybody's all hyped up about AI. But when I was investing in these companies, people around me was saying, you stupid. This is never going to work. Like, this is such a dumb idea. Like, how do you think this is actually going to work? And it was very tough on the founders. Like, they really had to have a lot of resilience, a lot of belief in what they were doing. And it was like, as I say, some of these companies I invested in seven, eight years ago, and they just had to keep going. They had to raise funding in that. And so in terms of what I look for, of course, it's the innovation. Of course, it's the impact. Of course, it's the team. Um, doesn't need to be groundbreaking. Yes. Um, are they super smart? Do they have deep domain knowledge? Yes. But I think there's also a level of resiliency and ability to adapt rapidly and to stay focused even when there's so much noise. And also to not be like thinking about what's what's a cool idea right in front of me because I, you just see those companies getting wiped out rapidly. Like I'm pretty brutal when it comes to the stuff because I've been doing it for so long where um, I'll sign up for something, I'll use it for, you know, like two days, three days or something. And you'll be like, okay, there's no value here. Like I need to, I need something better. It's not actually solving the problem that it purported to solve. And it's frustrating because you're seeking a problem that the AI is better at solving than as a human where you're trying to be more efficient. What, what are the key elements of customer value mm -hmm. that you think are making the most successful organizations in AI right now? That you've been doing this for a little while, so you've mm -hmm. probably seen some ones like, mm -hmm. what is that element of end customer value that's really resonating? There's too much hype in a lot of these companies. Like there's a lot of hype and there's a lot of impracticality. And the ones that are winning are actually solving it in a way that it actually improves things. It solves a problem, it delivers a return and the customer's smiling. I think that's what it comes down to. The customer's actually saying, um, I'm, I'm creating a better, more sustainable business, and my business is better for this than without this. And that's almost non-negotiable. I think that's what I'm definitely seeing, that it's like, it actually, like I think of Copilot in that, and I think about how the, the developers are responding to Copilot. And they're like, without a shadow of a doubt, they're all saying the same thing. And these are very, very talented developers. And they're like, this is actually de delivering tangible value to the way I work. It's giving me more time um, and it's enabling me to go faster and building my company. I think that's definitely a, a real life use case in terms of the real practical value. And are you willing to pay for it? They're all willing to pay. That's really encouraging to hear because there's a certain degree of the the basics of customer value have not shifted, right? That there's still everything that you said is something that I would apply to every technology. And so where I want to ask you then is as somebody who's been spending a lot of time thinking, you know, working and on AI for a very long period of time, you've got experience sort of pre inflection point. And if I, I think the release of chat GPT is an interesting inflection point because it boosted customer and public awareness 
at a very high level. And of course, now we're seeing flood more money and more investment because mm -hmm. everyone, th it, it, there's a fad element. Mm -hmm. But everything you've talked about is very core. Do you think there's a difference between what we're seeing, you know, what you saw pre-inflection point and post? Is this an element of speed or is there something else going on here post the inflection point? In terms of ability to acquire customers, ability to acquire talent, ability to um, deal with the IP stuff, like all kinds of stuff. Like I was very hands-on with several of these companies. And then, and it wasn't glamorous. There was nothing glamorous about it. It was a very, um, you know, like they used to talk about like the, the, the computer, the, like the hacker clubs back in the day, you know? And it was like that. It was like, we were doing it for the love of it. We were the weirdos, you know? Like people thought we were like super strange. Like when I go to people to raise capital for my companies, they'd be like, why are you guys doing this? There's nothing here. And then this, I remember a year before GPT came out, I was working on my book. I was already using a ton of AI tools because I was so frustrated with the way the, pub the, the, the publishing industry was set up. And so I was like using an AI editor and it was more valuable to me, the AI editor, which costs like 15 bucks a month or something, than a human editor and a human publisher. So it was an interesting, you talk about value and you think about the pound of flesh that the publisher was taking out of me. And I kept having these questions in terms of what value actual real tangible value are you take, giving me in return for taking a pound of flesh versus these AI tools which cost me nothing and it's clear as day because I open sourced the book to all my readers are adding substantially more value to my readers lives you're not doing that so it's a pretty simple equation but I want to ask you then so you're thinking a lot about it from the product development side and what products are. and I spend a lot of time thinking about services and I want to get your reaction to a, a way of thinking that I've been talking about to understand if it meshes. One of the things that I think that confusion is both good in that there's a lot of noise, customers have awareness, end customers, but they also have a lot of confusion because there's a lot of noise and they don't know what's real and what's right. And what I think the value of service providers will be is helping customers navigate what they need to know, what they don't need to know, and, and help get them to the right solution. That's a combination of services and products put together. And in a way, I've been likening this to uh, the role of sommeliers. And the reason I like this is because if we think about what's going on in AI, there's all these models and there's all these different, so the models get put together in different ways and that creates different kinds of products with different kinds of outcomes. And if we think about grapes, there's lots of different kinds of grapes and they get combined in different ways that create different kinds of wines, which then go with different food. The same way they go with different, these models will go with different customers. And if I think about the end, the, the space of service providers as like sommeliers helping guide the combination of, I understand the products and the models that went within them and how they got to that. And I can guide you to the right product for the right solution and can wrap context around it, that's a good place to be. What's your reaction to that, that premise and approach for service providers? Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Like those skills are critical, those services are critical because if, if you think about it from my perspective, at any point in time, there's so much happening. There's so many companies, there's so many products. And I feel like the feedback I'm receiving, because I do a ton of surveys is, customers are drowning. They're like overwhelmed. They're like, I don't even know where to begin. Like, this is scary. This is like, but they want the, so they want the tools because they want to ensure that their businesses continue to do well, continue to grow, continue to thrive as all this change happens. And service providers play a critical role in the ecosystem because um, I'm in Silicon Valley, the founder, like the companies they're building, they're creating, they're hyper-focused to what they're doing. So there has to be that intermediary who ensures that those implementations are successful. Well, good, because that's that. there's a space then for that. And, and so I want to extend that a little bit. What are you hearing as sort of the number one questions coming out of customers about how to be successful with these and I'll just sort of say AI infused products because, you know, what, what's, what's the best, the feedback that you're getting from, from customers? I think, um, often implementations, like when it comes to AI aren't as successful as they could be. And, um, customers are disappointed. Um, and if not disappointed, just curious as to why the black box never worked as well as it should have. 
Um, so I think um, that, along with the fact that there's a lot of resistance within like teams. So for example, the leadership is like, this is a great idea. I want to do this. But then the team's like, whoa, like this is very scary. So um, I'm seeing a lot of that as well, where um, you have to get the entire company on board when it comes to AI, because um, people, as mad as this may sound, but people are seeing the effects of this, even within the kids at school and that there's, there's this impact where I was with very, very high profile people this weekend. And the lady was saying, uh, like my kids are getting into trouble at school because they're using GPT. And so it's like, there's like this mixed messaging almost in terms of it's great for your company, but it's bad for your kids. So it's like kind of like, where do we stand as a society in terms of these things? If we say ultimately everybody's better for it. So, um, all kinds of reasons, but I think ultimately people want to be more efficient. Um, they want the technology to enable their teams to be more productive and, um, I don't think anyone really wants to, um, no one I've interacted with wants to replace their teams with AI. I think we can all see the value of humans. Like I've been doing this long enough and it's very clearly evident that humans play a critical role and past a certain point, as good as the AI may be, it's still wonderful to be engaging with another human. But it's like, how do we bring out the best in the human while partnering with the AI? How do we create that collaboration? That's a very powerful, cohesive collaboration, even within my own team. I'm constantly dealing with these, um, there's moments of friction. There's moments where you're like, how can I make this more fluid? Like I have an AI assistant and I have a human assistant and they work very well, but at the same time, there's constant like problems where we're running into walls where I have to step back and say, um, for the sake of my customers, for the sake of everyone I'm interacting with, how do we do this better? So I hope that answers your question. Well, you did. You've pretty much completely made the argument for the fact that a service around AI right now revolves around helping customers build frameworks for implementation that include like ethical ethics, Absolutely. strategy, and answering their why. So you've completely made the case that I've been talking about it without <laughs> me even having to do it. So I appreciate that. <laughs> it's just the truth. As I say, first, often I have to think about the stuff because it's so embedded in my life and I have to take a step back. But this is just my truthful experience that I think service providers are critical in this, in the future we're now moving faster and faster into. So Alicia, last question, I want to, want to give a sort of a positive thought. You spent a lot of time working with tech entrepreneurs and, and most of my audience are also small entrepreneurs building their own businesses. Like what's sort of the number one piece of advice that you give out for, for small entrepreneurs on being successful with their business? Sounds obvious, but it's be resilient. The one thing I have seen time and again is that you don't have to be the smartest you have to be the most resilient. And I think tech rewards resiliency. Um, if you know my story, like I've been knocked down more times than probably everyone I know. But at the same time, I was just like, you just get back up and you keep on going. And as as we go through these changes, it's gonna be a lot of like being knocked around in there. But the idea that you stay focused, you focus on your goals, your business goals, like all these types of things, um, your competitors are going to be panicking. Your competitors are going to be fearful. And the idea that you're like, I know where I'm going with my business and it's going to get choppy, but at the same time, I'm providing substantial value to my customers. And even with these changes, my customers feel a sense of loyalty to me because they know that I've got their best interests at heart and I will continue to deliver for them. That kind of, that thinking, that resiliency, that curiosity too around AI and ensuring that you're very well equipped to continue to, to, to partner, to truly partner both with the AI and your customers will stand you in extremely good stead. Well, that is a nice way to, le there, to leave this and also some ideas that stick with it regardless of the technology trend. So that's, that's really good news. If people, Absolutely. Are interested, if people are interested in learning more and getting, getting a copy of the book, where, where should we send them? Where should they go? Easiest place to get the book is Amazon. So you can get Amazon and it's, remember, Unemployable, How AI Transform My Work and My Life. I listen to my customers, rule number <laughs> one. And um, just I have a, a weekly AI newsletter that I work very hard on in terms of serving individuals such as your listeners. I'd love their feedback if there's stuff missing, if they find there's stuff they want to know more about. Um, as I say, I'm on the product side. Sign up. It's a free newsletter. Um, and you can get it at readunemployable.com. Connect with me as well. I want to hear from you. LinkedIn's the best place to connect with me. 
you are my people. So <laughs> this is our revolution. <laughs> <laughs> That's super cool. Alicia, thanks for joining me today. This has been great fun. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Eureka Process is now a Gazinta company. Eureka Process, the consulting team focused on you streamlining your MSP, is now part of Gazinta. The SaaS company focused on empathy and getting shit done quickly and correctly. What does that mean? First, Gazinta Mobius customers will get even better customer support for their products. The Eureka team will be looking at ways to deliver better customer support and give their thoughts on how to make the products better. It also means that you can come to Gazinta for more of your consulting needs when you want to own a business, not be owned by your business. Process Consulting will give you the freedom you need. Visit gazinta.com slash eureka to learn more. The Business of Tech is written by me, Dave Sobel, under ethics guidelines posted at businessof.tech. This episode was edited and produced by Picture This Video. If you like the content, please make sure to hit that like button and follow and subscribe. It's the free and easy way to support the show and help us grow. You can also check out our Patreon, where you can join the Business of Tech community at patreon.com slash mspradio, or buy our Why Do We Care merch at businessof.tech. Finally, if you're interested in advertising on the show, visit mspradio.com slash engage. Thanks for listening today, and I will talk to you again on the next episode of the Business of Tech. part of the MSP Radio Network.